Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the IDSS Distinguished uh, Series Seminar. Today, um, we are really thrilled to have uh, Rob Nowak as our uh, speaker. So Rob is not a stranger to MIT. I mean, we have been, had him many, uh, several times, but most recently in our advisory board at IDSS, we feel like he's given us a lot of advice and direction of how to go. Um, so in the past, he's done a lot of work in complex interactions and complex networks, but today, looking from the title of the talk, I see that it's theoretical foundation of active learning, a very popular and important subject in the context of uh, machine learning and so forth. So we're looking forward to a very nice seminar. Okay, well, uh, thank you everybody. Great to see so many people here today. Uh, it's fun to be back here and the weather is terrific, so this is nice too. Um, I mean, I, what I wanted to do is, and this is sound okay to you, it sounds kind of echoey to me, but as long as it's cool for you, so um, I wanted to sort of give you uh, an overview of a, a topic and a research area that I've been exploring for about a decade. Uh, and and it, I think now it's sort of coming of age in terms of being really maybe relevant to practice. And so I thought it would be a good time to kind of give you the story from my perspective of this area called active learning. I'll explain what that means. Uh, and then tell you about some of the recent work that we've been doing in this area that's motivated by some of the uh, very recent ways that people have started to mathematically analyze uh, machine learning systems, particularly neural networks and deep learning systems. Uh, so let's see, I think I got this little thing. Okay, so um, this picture is just kind of a, a depiction of the standard machine learning pipeline. And the way uh, things would conventionally work is we have a large database of, of, I'll call it raw data. For example, it could be unlabeled images or unlabeled text documents. Uh, we want to create a labeled training set so that we can train a machine learning system to automatically do this labeling process. So here I'm showing the canonical uh, image classification type of task. And so how this is done is some person or a team of humans uh, that goes through this laborious task of labeling a bunch of the training data so that we can train the machine to mimic that labeling process that the humans are doing. And uh, this is uh, how a lot of the successes in machine learning have uh, been happening following this basic paradigm. I am one of the biggest kind of loads in the system is the load on, on humans in this training process. And uh, relatively little attention has been paid to how do we do this except, well, let's just crowdsource everything and maybe labor is cheap enough that we can do that. Um, so this is just a, the, the, the usual picture you see about all the great successes of machine learning. Uh, and I'd say in every one of these successes are things that involve tons and tons of, of labeled training data. So for example, in the case of uh, images uh, or uh, uh, language translation involved a, a lot of labeled images or using all the text from UN translations and so forth. Uh, and in the case of game playing, there's a lot of self-playing going on. Uh, more than even uh, humans could do in a reasonable amount of time. So there's some kind of evidence that at least uh, not only do these machine learning successes require tons and tons of labeled data, but they're also learning in a way that's really not like humans are learning, and that might be something important to pay attention to as well. So uh, there's kind of a, a, a now a, an effort uh, across the machine learning community to figure out how can we train machines with less labeled data and less human supervision. And there are a number of ways people are kind of tackling this problem. I'm going to talk about one particular approach, which is the so-called active learning approach. And here's a picture that just explains this idea pretty simply. The idea is that rather than just taking all the raw unlabeled data and asking humans to label some subset of it, maybe chosen at random, instead what we'll do is we'll have the machine learning algorithm itself look at all the unlabeled data and strategically select examples that it'd like humans to annotate for it. And so roughly speaking, what's happening is the machine is learning a predictive model, and as it learns that predictive model, it can also start to make judgments about how confident it might be in its prediction for various unlabeled examples. And then roughly speaking, unlabeled examples that it feels it doesn't have a lot of confidence in are the ones that it will ask the human expert to label. Okay, so that's the idea of the goal, the machine automatically and adaptively selecting the most informative examples for labeling. And the hope is that this can reduce the burden on, on this uh, human dimension of the problem. So uh, 
uh, recently, and I think both of these uh, uh, kind of products or, or services are, are relatively new. Uh, this is Amazon's SageMaker Ground Truth uh, aimed at reducing this cost of labeling, and they talk about using active learning techniques and so forth. So that's a new service that's kind of directly connected to their uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk system and all that. And so they're cognizant of this, this big challenge of, of getting large label data sets for training. And Prodigy is a company, I think they've focused a lot on uh, natural language types of problems, but they also have some stuff in image classification and other things. And again, they're, they're using active learning to try to uh, be able to train machines using less labeled examples from humans. Okay, so people are starting to try to turn these into products. Uh, I'll just give you one little kind of application that I had some students work on a few years ago to give you an idea of how you might do it and why you might do it. So this is uh, trying to use uh, electronic health records to predict disease outcomes. And so the way it actually works in practice is these electronic health records are inspected by human experts. These are clinicians who know how to read these uh, records, and then they will provide uh, a judgment or a label about what they really think is going on with a particular patient. Maybe do they really have a particular disease, or did a doctor just order the test? Or uh, do we expect that this person might develop a particular problem 90 days going forward? And so these human experts are providing those annotations that then are turned over to a machine learning algorithm that tries to automatically do these classifications using the electronic health records. And the problem or the challenge here is that these people, it takes them minutes, sometimes you know, maybe up to a half hour to, to just go over one of these electronic health records and they're being paid about $150 an hour minimally. And so these are very, very expensive labels to collect. It's a very time intensive and expertise intensive process. So it's not always the case that we can just run off to Amazon Mechanical Turk and hire a bunch of people who are going to be labeling images while they're watching their favorite TV series at the same time. Sometimes we need really expert advice uh, in this machine training process. So uh, just to give you an idea at a very high level, like what's the heuristic or basic thinking that people might bring to this active learning problem, uh, you can kind of imagine it with this picture. I'm showing you uh, a situation where you have two electronic health record features. Usually in this application, we do something like we do some flattening of the database, so now each electronic health record is maybe a 10,000 dimensional uh, feature vector, but I'll just look at two so we can see it visually. So the idea is here that maybe uh, red is disease and blue is healthy. F suppose we've had our experts label a few of these electronic health records. We could say, based on those labeled examples, this is the best linear classifier we have at this point. And then the question is, well, how do we improve that linear classifier? Well, the traditional approach would just pick another electronic health record at random, ask a human expert to label it. That would give us some sort of improvement in our prediction process. So this is the sort of error rate. It goes down. The more labeled examples we give our machine learning algorithm, the better uh, the machine learning algorithm performs at test time. Uh, what active learning would do is it would say, well, no, let's like be a little more strategic. The machine has this best linear model in its head. It can look at all the unlabeled examples and pick an example, for example, one that's close to that current decision boundary that might be more informative than a randomly chosen example. And the hope is then we'd see some better kind of trade-off between error rate and, and uh, number of labeled examples needed to achieve a given error rate. So that's kind of the, the high-level heuristic idea that's used a lot. Uh, and um, this is you know, an example of how this would play out in this, this sort of situation of electronic health records. So here we had 10,000 records, about 6,000 features, uh, and uh, the, these two curves are active and passive learning. And here we got about a 2 to 3x uh, improvement uh, in the number of examples needed to get a particular error rate out of our, our trained model. And so it can accelerate this. And again, you know, if it's a very uh, time and expertise intensive process, this is something that could be uh, really beneficial. Okay, so this is just kind of introductory to give you a, a little bit of a sense of how people start thinking about this problem. Does that, anybody have any questions about anything I said so far? Good. So uh, that sounds kind of great, maybe. You know, why, why won't we always do active learning then? That, that seems like a no-brainer. Well, there's some hurdles. And one hurdle is that active learning is basically combining data fitting, if you will, and data collection. And so that means it's going to require some sort of interactive computing infrastructure. So is that so easy? Like, what does normal machine learning do? You 
come up with an algorithm, and then you download a data set and you test your algorithm on it. Well, that's not what's happening here. Building the data set is part of the algorithm or part of the algorithmic uh, process. And so uh, it's not that easy to even start experimenting and, and prototyping algorithms in this domain because of that. Uh, another challenge is that this is a closed loop feedback system effectively. And so uh, all sorts of issues associated with algorithm design and analysis become more challenging. Uh, and so just the mathematics of this are, are just one level even more difficult than normal machine learning uh, open loop systems. And then finally, uh, Data selection, as I was sort of suggesting with that linear classifier, I use that linear model as a way of deciding which examples are going to be more informative. And so that whole data selection process is biased by the model structures that I'm, I'm using. And so model misspecification and inductive bias, which can be a good, uh, inductive bias can be good because you sometimes need to do it just to control the complexity of the problem, but it can be really dangerous here because it can actually lead you into uh, a, a bad solution altogether. So active learning is really leaning heavily on modeling assumptions just to collect the data, and that's something that has to be uh, really thought about, and that's uh, former UW-Madison person George Box. Great quote. Okay, so let me just tell you, I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, but how did we uh, address this first issue of interactive computing? Uh, there was no way to do it easily, so some very ambitious students of mine uh, built a software system, it's an open source software system that basically allows you to uh, build and prototype active learning algorithms. So a lot of the interactive computing infrastructure is built into this system, so really all you would have to do is write your Python code that's gonna be the algorithm that you wanna run and a lot of the other uh, infrastructure, the database stuff and all that is handled by this system. So uh, we've used this a lot, a lot of other people in industry and in government have used the system for prototyping active learning algorithms. So um, now, and I'm just gonna walk over here and grab my water a little bit. Uh, I just wanted to kind of walk through what I think are some of the uh, basic mathematical principles of active learning, uh, and then I'll, I'll move into what are some of the limitations of m most of what we've done so far in this area. Okay, so, um, First of all, I just kind of want to give my take on how do you identify whether your problem might benefit from active learning? And the way I like to think about this is in terms of what and where information. And so let me illustrate what I mean in a few different examples. So a, a what question is, what is the conditional probability of Y, say a label, given a feature X? That's a what question. A where question would be, where is that conditional probability larger than a half, right? So that's exactly saying what are the, what's the decision set for, say, a binary classification problem. So that's what I'm kind of illustrating here. What information would be, let's estimate this function, where information would be, just tell me where that set is, where the function exceeds one half, okay? Um, in density estimation, you can say what's the density function of x, or you could just say where is x bigger than some small value epsilon. That might come up in a clustering exercise. So that's the, the what information, the red sets there. And then in function estimation, you could say what is the conditional expectation of y given x. Um, you might not really care what that full conditional expectation is in this discrete problem. Maybe you just wanna know what uh, x will give me the largest y, the maximum reward, and that would be like a multi-arm bandit type of problem. And so. That's the, the where information in that problem. And the basic thing I want you to take away from this slide is that uh, active learning is good in many cases and can be very helpful if you're interested in where information. If you're interested in what information, like estimating a whole density function, maybe it's not gonna help so much. But if you're trying to localize something about that function, where is it taking its maximum value? Where is it exceeding a certain level? That's when active learning can help because those questions become local questions, and that's where focusing the sampling can help. Okay, so let me illustrate with the simplest problem that everybody's seen in, in their undergraduate computer science class or wherever, it's just learning a one-dimensional classifier. So here's, here's the picture, here's some, so I was showing you unlabeled data, let's suppose that's the labeling of those data, and what we're interested in here is this decision boundary, where, where should we decide to say something's red versus blue? And the two ways you might think of approaching this immediately are either by asking for random examples and labeling them or trying to do some sort of binary search. If you really had this hypothesis that 
it should be a one-dimensional sort of threshold at some point, then naturally binary search or a bi bisection type of procedure could be really effective. And so that's what I was showing there with that little movie. And you know, as you probably know, uh, what happens here is that if I'm just picking random examples, my kind of uh, error in localizing where that decision boundary is going down like one over the number of samples that I take, uh, but it's going down exponentially quickly if I do binary search. And so that's a, a simple example or illustration of when it, the question is where should this boundary go, adaptively sampling is much, much more effective than randomly sampling examples. Okay. So what have people tried to do? Well, they've tried to take that intuition behind something like binary search and develop it into a more general principle. And so this is sort of the meta-algorithm that is at the heart of a lot of active learning methods, and it would go something like this. You have a set of models, or sometimes called hypothesis space, and this is called version space because basically what you're going to do is maintain a version of all the models that are in some sense consistent with the data you've seen so far. And the basic thing says you, you kind of iterate through this three-step procedure. You sample at random from the available data set. You label only those ex examples or samples that somehow distinguish models within your version space. So if all the models are, make the same prediction for a particular example, you wouldn't bother asking for that one. But if there's some disagreement, then you would label those examples. And then you look at the labels you collect and remove all the models that are not consistent or inconsistent with that. And you can be uh, different notions of consistency can be used there. But that's the sort of procedure. And basically, a, a kind of a cartoon-like picture of this, you have the three steps represented by your set of models, your pool of examples, and the labels you collect. And what you're going to do is you're going to look at your set of models. You're going to say, oh, OK, which examples should I ask for labels of? I get those labels, and I use those labels to reduce the set of models. Okay? So it's exactly kind of a, 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 a general version of this idea of binary search. So what, what did people do then? They said, OK, well, how do we make a theory out of this? And they took tools from statistical learning theory, including things like VC theory, uh, and then extended this simple idea of binary search to higher dimensional problems. And so I'll just kind of illustrate the simplest higher dimensional version of it, which is learning a multidimensional linear classifier. And so in this setup here, I'm going to imagine that the pool of unlabeled examples are anywhere in this gray circle. Okay, so I can ask for a label anywhere in there, or that's where I'll be drawing my samples from. And so, uh, and I'm going to have a linear classifier, and I'll just assume that it goes through the origin. So I think that the middle here is the origin, and I don't know which linear classifier is the right one. So what am I going to do? I'm going to get a bunch of labeled examples. I'm going to look at those, and I'm going to say, oh, okay, well, what linear classifiers are consistent with those? Will it be any of these are consistent? And so this is, originally, all linear classifiers were my version space. But now, only classifiers uh, that I'm showing you here are in the version space. All the others are inconsistent with these labeled examples. So this green area is this, this version space or region of disagreement. So these are places where one or more of these classifiers will disagree with samples in that region. Okay, so now we're going to collect another set of examples. We won't get labels yet. We'll look at them. We'll say, oh, OK, well, some of those are in the, the gray area, the region of agreement among the remaining hypotheses. But these two are in the region of disagreement. So those will help us refine what we think are, are the plausible models. We get labels for those. Uh, and then we reduce. And now we have a, a smaller version space after we've taken those examples, and we repeat this. So is that pretty clear to everybody? So um, you know, if you wanted to kind of write that down in, in the kind of uh, little algorithm or pseudocode that I had before, what you could do is, you know, if you think you might have possibly noisy labels, you can use uh, VC bounds on the error rates and remove probably suboptimal classifiers. So basically what this means is you sample at random, you compute localized risks on that region of disagreement, and then you check for a given predictor, how does it compare to the best possible predictor in that, that space on the, the data that you've collected. And you have confidence intervals on those. And so if you say, like, here's the best guy. He's got the smallest empirical risk down here. I'm pretty confident that his true risk is somewhere in here. 
Here's another predictor. His empirical risk is here, and I'm pretty confident that he's somewhere, the true risk of that guy is somewhere in here, so I'll remove him because he's, now I'm pretty confident that he can't be better than this one because their confidence intervals don't overlap, and that's what this step is doing right here. So it's essentially just saying a kind of robust version of this notion of inconsistent. It doesn't have to, no class where may be perfectly consistent, but some may be so inconsistent that we can definitely throw them out. Okay. So uh, this is uh, sort of the, the sum of, of, of work in that area. It would say something like this. It would say if the optimal Bayes classifier, let's call that F star, so this is the uh, optimal classifier that would be based on knowing the true distributions of the data, the labels and the features. If that Bayes classifier is in some finite VC class, for example, a linear classifier in D dimensions or something else, and if we have nice distributions, if the label noise isn't too bad, then if we look at <coughs> F hat would be uh, our empirical uh, rule that comes out of this active learning process, F star is the Bayes classifier. This is the difference in the error rate from this guy relative to the best. And that kind of excess risk, as we call it, goes down like VC dimension over the number of samples if we were just picking samples at random, but it goes down exponentially quickly if we're doing this active learning adaptive uh, selection of examples. And so it exactly gives us this kind of picture that we, we started off with, where this sort of place where they bottom out is just the Bayes risk. Um, so there are some other interesting issues that come up in, in this kind of theory, uh, but kind of the, one of the problems is that it really is leaning heavily on this. It's sort of like you're, you're in a well-specified situation. The optimal classifier is in this nice class that's manageable, this VC class that you're considering. And for most real problems, that won't be the case. And then you wonder, well, if, if, if I can't guarantee this nice, well-specified kind of condition, what's going to happen here? I, maybe I, this theory tells me nothing. Okay? At best, it might tell me that we don't do worse than passive learning, which isn't a very satisfying answer. Is there a question anywhere? I thought I saw somebody maybe. If there's any question at any point, just feel free to chime in. OK. So uh, I want to kind of, with that in mind, kind of go back to this issue of uh, inductive bias. And so, if I was looking at this situation again with two features, maybe the picture of labeled data looks like this. And of course, if I, you force me to use a linear classifier, I'd like to use this one. I'll, it won't be perfect. I can't get these guys out of a simple linear classifier. The problem is, is maybe my active learning procedure, because of the inductive bias of the whole procedure, could converge to the suboptimal solution. If I just did, took, you know, collected examples at random, uh, then empirical risk minimization, for example, will get us to this one eventually. But in active learning, we're sort of steering the selection of data based on the model class, and we might end up converging to a suboptimal solution if we're not careful, right? And so basically what all the kind of past theory of active learning would tell you in a situation like this is they'd say, well, uh, Hopefully, we can at least guarantee that if this is the situation where our models don't really fit the data, maybe we'll perform no worse than just the passive learning model, again, the random selection of training examples. But if you try to make an algorithm that's sort of aggressive enough to get you those really big exponential gains, you could actually be converging to suboptimal solutions. So it's a very kind of dangerous situation to be in because we don't know truth. And this is worrisome because of things like this that we have to look forward to. Uh, if we have an AI god, I want to make sure this god is not too biased. So we're, we, we've got to make sure we address this. Not, nothing to play around with. OK, good. So I think I've motivated the issue. So um, you know, people have kind of wrestled with uh, this problem of going non-parametric, like sort of moving out of these finite VC classes and so forth. And so I kind of want to just illustrate a little bit of what's been done there. Some of it's work that I've done in the past. There's some other people like Steve Haneke and uh, Kolchinsky at Georgia Tech have looked at this as well. Uh, but it's a little bit of a narrow community because I'll, I'll tell you right now, it's not very useful. But it's kind of interesting and in, enlightening, at least from a kind of understanding point of view. So here's how you might think about it. So you might say, oh, I have these data. And uh, maybe this conditional probability function looks like this surface here. I'm drawing the one-half level set. Uh, 
on this function, and I'm just trying to I've superimpose that, that set over back here on the data. And so the idea is to think of that, and those would be the decision regions then, and this is to think about these decision boundaries as being nonparametric curves or surfaces that are not in a finite VC class. Okay? And this will hopefully give our models much more flexibility, much more capacity to handle whatever the data really are doing. So how can we do active learning in this setting where we're not in this nice, essentially finite dimensional parametric world? So um, these nonparametric kinds of problems have been studied in machine learning and statistics. Uh, and this slide just summarizes one particular perspective on this, one way to kind of characterize what makes a problem easy or difficult. Uh, and one thing you would naturally think of is, well, how, how crazy are these decision boundaries? And how wiggly are they? And you can measure that by some notion of holder smoothness or some other uh, measure of regularity of those nonparametric curves or surfaces. Uh, and then uh, another thing that f figures in is how exactly are labels related to features? Is there a really nice, uh, clear separation between classes, or is there kind of a, a fuzzy transition between the two classes like I'm showing here? So there's this no noise condition, which is basically telling you how smooth is the decision boundary, or how smooth is the conditional probability function in the vicinity of the decision boundary. So uh, Sasha Sibikoff and other people have looked at this a lot, and Rui Castro and I kind of looked at it through the lens of this active learning process, and we kind of know exactly how that excess risk decays both in the passive and active learning uh, cases in this situation, and the difference is sort of hidden down here in this, this exponent, but there's a little bit of a, uh, of a win for active learning, and in particular, if you go back to a situation, this is basically like, uh, a, a very smooth function with very little noise, almost like the binary search case where those nice uh, kind of uh, situations with VC classes, we get back to this kind of exponential improvement for active learning. So you can go all the way to situations where active learning won't give you any really benefit because there's so little structure in the problem to recovering these kind of uh, very big exponential improvements that you saw with binary search and, and the VC theory stuff. Um, so I want to just say one thing about how this is essentially how people establish these things, which illuminates the problem with them and the impracticality of them. And so how did we prove that those rates are the right rates, that the actual upper bounds and lower bounds are what I just told you? Well, the main idea was to look at this so-called boundary fragment class. So here was a picture of those decision boundaries that I showed you before. Boundary fragment class means like kind of consider really simple cases where the boundary is sort of a, a func has a functional description of one variable in terms of the other. So now what you can do with that kind of reduction to just this boundary fragment is you can divide it into a bunch of one-dimensional problems. And then from those one-dimensional problems, you can uh, just, oops, just apply uh, your favorite, uh, sorry, you guys have to, your favorite kind of one-dimensional analysis, like a kind of noisy binary search or something like that. And so that's how Rui and I did it. Uh, that's what allows you to get back to the, the kind of rates I was talking about before. And you can um, you know, generalize this to use you know, some sort of epsilon net or some other abstraction. But it becomes you know, interesting mathematically, but impossible practically to use it in any way. And so that's what this slide is kind of coming to. Uh, what I see are the shortcomings of most of the, the theory for this field of active learning. And these are not a comprehensive list of, of papers, but basically either simple models like finite VC classes, and then you have this inductive bias issue, or they're non-parametric or, or, or very flexible, but not very practical. They give you some insight into what, when active learning might help and how much it might help, but not how you'd actually do it in practice. So, um, so this bothered me, and uh, I, I started thinking about other ways to view this, this problem of what you might call non-parametric or over-parameterized models to avoid bias in active learning. And this is a really nice paper that I think uh, highlights two, the two salient uh, kind of things you might try to capitalize in active learning. One is what we've already talked about. Somehow you'd like to get labeled examples close to this decision boundary that you're trying to learn so that you can really nail it down precisely. That's sort of the binary search idea. But another idea is that, well, if I 
could somehow look at my raw data and see that there were clusters of data. Uh, an obvious thing to try is say, find a cluster, get one representative from each cluster, and then uh, if that was what you got, you'd just kind of maybe say, oh, all this should be blue, all that should be red, and so on and so forth. So that's sort of the clustering idea of active learning. And both of those can be effective, and both can be relevant in the same problem. Uh, and so Sandro Descupta has a nice kind of discussion of this, and he also has some really kind of clever algorithms specifically kind of addressing this. And if I have time, I could tell, talk about it, but I didn't want to spend too much time talking about everything. So I'll talk about one uh, initial idea that, that caught my attention that kind of uh, nicely integrates these two faces of active learning together in one place. Uh, this is some work by Jerry Zhu, a colleague of mine, uh, John Lafferty and Zubin Garamani uh, from uh, 2003. So it goes back a little bit, but this 2003 was the heyday of semi-supervised learning. So the idea of semi-supervised learning is you say, I have all of my data, I'm going to construct some sort of graph structure across those data, I'm going to lab get some labeled examples, usually the passive model, just uniformly at random, but then I'm going to use the structure of the data graph as a kind of a proxy for the data manifold or whatever you want to call it, and I'll try to propagate the labels in a way that respects the geometry of the graph. And so they, they Jerry and, and John and Zubin were people who worked a lot on that idea, and they used the same kind of philosophy to develop an active learning procedure. And essentially what they did is they said, well, uh, let's use some sort of prior model over this graph or the graph Laplacian associated with the graph and then use it to kind of strategically select which examples are going to minimize some measure of predictive risk. And what that tends to do, and it, it's kind of a heuristic, but it worked really well, is it kind of tends to give you uh, some representatives in each cluster, but then also more sampling, more densely sampling near where there might be sort of cuts in this graph. And so the idea would be get a few of those labeled examples and then propagate the labels to the rest of the graph using nearest neighbors or the graph Laplacian basis or something like that. And it, it really works quite well in practice. So um, that, that gave me you know, some idea about how you might actually start develop, developing some theory for this. And, and what we thought about is taking that idea but in a little different direction, trying to think about a binary search on, on a graph. And I'm just going to explain in words and a little cartoon how that would go and then tell you what the basic result is. But the idea would be if I had this graph structure over my data, I'd start picking examples at random. Each node is an example and I'd get the label. And at some point I'd have at least one red and at least one blue. And at that point I'd stop this random sampling process. And now we'll compute the shortest path between the oppositely labeled examples. So there are the shortest path between the red and the blue here red and blue there, and red and blue there. So there are three shortest paths in this example. And among those, we're going to focus on the shortest, shortest path, the one that has the fewest number of edges in it, and then select a point near uh, a, a node near the midpoint of that particular path and get its label. And we're going to repeat that process. And what it actually tends to do is focus on sort of as efficiently as possible learning the cut set of this graph. So the idea would be if the graph really could be decomposed into uh, homogeneously labeled components, what this algorithm is essentially doing is efficiently finding the cut set of the graph. And you can, I think I have a little, uh, and then once you find that, you could propagate the labels however you want. So the, the basic theorem for this one is that if the cut set consists of m edges, then you only need about order m labeled examples to accurately label the entire data set. So I think that's kind of maybe the philosophy that, uh, these tools that I mentioned before, like SageMaker and Prodigy, have in mind, it's maybe more like interactive data set annotation than it is like active learning the way we were thinking about before. We just would somehow love to label the whole data set. One way to do that is to literally have people label the whole data set, or you could try to be somehow clever about it and hope that the few labels that you do collect give you a good way of predicting all the other labels, sort of transducing that small labeled set to the rest. And, you, and it can be more efficient if you do it actively as opposed to passively. All right, so uh, I'll just mention quickly that one of the things that motivated me to look at this is because it allowed me to move away from this kind of uh, boundary fragment model that I was talking about before and actually say something about at least situations where we have a multidimensional decision boundaries that are sort of like Lipschitz smooth, 
Uh, and you can prove that if you just uh, ran that algorithm on a situation like this, you actually uh, essentially achieved the optimal sample complexity. So it gave us at least a practical algorithm to handle some of those problems we talked about before, too. So um, I just wanted to now kind of move into the final part of my talk here. Uh, and this is work with Mina Karzand, who is a former uh, IDSS uh, student here who worked with Guy. Uh, she came to Madison uh, about a, a year ago, or maybe a little more, and, and uh, we talked about a lot of things. One of the things I, I told her I was interested in were, was active learning and multi-armed bandits, and she said, oh, that sounds really cool. And she sort of asked this question, can we develop active learning algorithms that would work with popular modern methods like kernel methods and neural networks? And I said, well, yeah, that's a great question because these graphs approaches are interesting, but they kind of require a lot of things. They require building the graph, searching over the graph. Both of those are kind of intensive and also a little bit ad hoc. How do I decide how to build that graph in the first place? That plays a huge role in how well these methods will work. And so uh, she kind of want, encouraged me to start thinking about uh, these models. And, and specifically, we've been kind of looking at shallow neural networks, so two-layer neural networks or kernel classifiers, which all basically have this kind of picture where you have an input layer, a hidden layer, and then your output. Okay. So um, to start with, I said, well, we should start reading what, what are people doing in the theory area for those kinds of models. And this is a, a paper from Misha Belkin and his collaborators on the so-called double descent curve, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen. But it's uh, starting to trying to explain what we're observing with things like deep neural networks, which have many more parameters or weights in them than training examples uh, in a machine learning situation. And so the picture is sort of saying, here's our usual thing, error versus model complexity. Typically, we'd like to do some regularization so that we find this place where the test error is minimized. That would typically be at a place where our model is not perfectly fitting the data. Going out here would be overfitting, which is something we'd like to avoid because, yes, as you start to fit perfectly to the data, the generalization performance is going to degrade. But what's interesting is if you push past that interpolation threshold, where essentially the number of weights in your model is equal to the number of training examples, if you have even more degrees of freedom or weights in your model, you can actually do better uh, even though you're doing data fitting. And the, the key thing is you have to be, you're basically giving, you're saying all of these models are interpolating, but if I have more degrees of freedom or flexibility in my model, there's more functions that can be interpolating functions. And some of those functions have much nicer properties than the ones right here. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of what this is saying here. Maximizing model smoothness, minimizing some notion of function norm subject to interpolation constraints. Can you yield models that generalize? And Sasha, for example, has done some, some really great work uh, with Misha and others uh, on this topic and explaining it that it, that it actually has some mathematical basis for this. So this is a picture from Misha's paper that I like that you know, he did a bunch of empirical studies. Other people have done them too, but you, you definitely see this. I think this is with a MNIST and a, ne a, a shallow neural network, but you see uh, this, this uh, overfitting coming up, but then as you go to the overparameterized regime, uh, the error actually gets better. And so this kind of thing is observed in practice, and now there's some emerging theory to explain it. And what Mina and I decided to do is try to take this uh, understanding and some of the ideas uh, here and bring them into this world of active learning. So I'll kind of explain it again with pictures. Uh, and and I, just to make it visual, let's think about a simple one-dimensional problem. So here are six labeled examples. All these open circles here on the line are unlabeled examples. I don't know what their labels are yet. And this is. Uh, uh, an interpolating function uh, for those uh, uh, six labeled examples. And so uh, the question is, well, which, which example should we choose next to have labeled? That's the whole idea in active learning. You have this flexibility. We could label any of them. And whichever one we choose, either the label is going to come out to be plus one or minus one, say in this binary classification case, which one we don't know which one it will be. And we, we have to decide which example to actually have labeled. And so you can just kind of go through, well, what, what could happen in each case? So if I pick this example, it happens to be an unlabeled example whose two nearest neighbors are both red. So I could choose to label that. It, you know, it could, if I asked the label, it could turn out to be blue. 
And if it turns out to be blue, I'm going to try to interpolate it again. Now with that new point being labeled blue, and I would get a particular function. So it's this blue curve, and you can see it's, it's much more wiggly and, and oscillatory than the original uh, interpolator of the first six points. On the other hand, I could, it might happen if I asked for that label, it turns out to be red. If it were red, then I hardly have to change the interpolation function at all, because that red point sits right between two previously interpolated points. So we can kind of, without even drawing the picture, we can gauge how smooth or unsmooth these two are by looking at some appropriate norm. So here, that new point, if it turned out to be blue, would be difficult to interpolate. Here, if it turns out to be red, it's easy to interpolate. We can gauge that by, by an appropriate norm. The norm would be either, for example, if we're using a kernel, uh, the, the norm associated with the reproducing kernel Hilbert space, or in the case of neural networks, it could be some appropriate norm of the weights in the neural network. So um, here's just another case. Suppose we swing over to this position, which is an unlabeled example that's between oppositely labeled uh, initial points. So in that case, whether the new point turns out to be a blue labeled example or a red labeled example, in either case, it's going to be difficult to interpolate it because it sort of wants to be right in between red and blue, but we're going to it's going to have to be either red or blue. And so in both cases, that interpolating function has a large norm. And so this is kind of then our heuristic. We're going to say we're going to select the next example to label to be the example that has the max of the min of these two norms. In other words, we're going to try to label the point that maximizes the norm of the new interpolating function, irregardless of whether the label we get is, is red or blue, or plus or one or minus one. And so that's basically, again, showing this picture. In both cases, it's going to be tough to do that interpolation. And the, the sort of intuition is that attacking the most challenging points in the input space first may eliminate the need to label other easier examples later. Okay. And this is uh, the paper with Mina, if anybody wanted to look at it. So, um, so that's just, you say, OK, well, so what? Does, what does it do? Well, it turns out to have a lot of nice properties uh, mathematically and also experimentally. So I'll just kind of tell you a little bit about it. So we're going to look at two specific types of things. Again, a, a kernel uh, classifier, where uh, the functions that we're using are, are in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And the norm that we use to measure smoothness uh, is uh, the norm associated with that Hilbert space. And in the case of a neural network, we're going to look at a two-layer rectified linear unit uh, neural network. Uh, and the way we're going to measure our norm is the L2 norm of the weights of the neural network. And then again, we pick which example we're going to choose to label as the one that satisfies this maximum criterion. So what are the properties? Uh, well, uh, typically, you, you, can a you can actually solve this min without actually computing these interpolating functions. It, usually, the min is achieved by just the sign of the current interpolator based on the previously labeled examples. Um, it tends to select samples near the current decision boundary and that are close to oppositely labeled examples. And this reduces provably to binary search in one dimension. So I'll kind of just uh, show you that in a second. But I, I wanted to tell you one thing that, so, so the basic idea of why this is happening is it's going to prefer to choose points that are in between oppositely labeled examples, which should sort of already suggest a kind of bisection type of procedure is going on. To show it that happens is sort of the, the work. Uh, in the case of the, the neural network models, uh, there's this kind of interesting set of results uh, that, that Nadi Cerebro and his group developed for the special case of Relu's. And one of my students has kind of taken it a little further. And it's this result that basically, if you have a two-layer neural network, and if the activation function is the Green's function of a linear time invariant operator L, then as long as you have a sufficiently wide network, the solutions to that minimum norm neural network problem are so-called L splines. And that basically includes all splines you could think of, linear splines, uh, polynomial splines, fractional splines, all sorts of things. And so this is just a picture. Like Nadi's group kind of showed this, this behavior of the ReLU network. Uh, this is just using rectified cubic units. Then you get cubic splines. And so that kind of connection back to splines is kind of an important ingredient that allows us to understand this bisection property for the neural networks. And so this is a movie uh, of showing this. So here's, the, just let me give you the setup. It's a one-dimensional function that's 
plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one. And so what we'd hope to do is just kind of nail down where are these decision boundaries. And I'll just kind of run the movie. This is a, a run of this procedure. And you can see like it just sort of searches around a little bit, but then just basically does this bisection type of behavior. So this is uh, a set of samples. If I stop the procedure at a certain point, it's basically localized where these boundaries are. And so the theorem here will go something like this. If you have endpoints uniformly distributed in the unit interval, labeled according to some piecewise constant binary function G with K pieces, uh, then if you use uh, a, a neural network or a kernel method in this active learning procedure, you can perfectly predict all of the labels if you just take something like K log N uh, examples and label them. So labeling all the data would be N labels. Here you get away with something like K log N, which is the, the minimum for this kind of problem. Here's a picture. It's a little harder to analyze what's going on in multiple dimensions. This is just a, a simulation experiment of what it does. But it, it, it sort of does what I was talking about also with that S squared algorithm. It kind of starts to figure out where this boundary is, and then it kind of just follows it, almost like uh, uh, it's sort of stitching the contour of that boundary. And so that's uh, sort of the multidimensional case. OK, so um, what are, how am I doing on time? I think I have a little bit. I'm almost done. So what are some of the strengths and weaknesses of this maximum criterion? Well, I'm just showing you kind of the evolution in that kind of problem here as I get more labeled examples. Eventually, I've got this really perfect demarcation of that decision boundary. Here is uh, sort of the uh, test error as a function of labeled examples. And what you see is that uh, eventually, red here is this active thing. It's, it's really blowing the, the passive method. This is going down like 1 over n, basically. This guy is going down. Uh, much faster, but this initial part, uh, passive learning is actually looking a little better. So that's, that looks promising. This looks a little bit problematic. And what's happening is in these early stages, we're, we're somehow like here, whereas passive learning would have taken a bunch of randomly chosen examples all over. So it somehow has some global understanding of the problem where this is so myopic, it's, it's so singularly focused on finding the decision boundary that it, it can be a little suboptimal or a lot suboptimal at very early stages with a very small number of examples. And one of the issues is that these norms uh, that we're using are not really sensitive to the data distribution. All they're measuring is function smoothness irrespective of the actual distribution of data. So we, uh, again, just sort of as a, a heuristic, we said, well, how could we fix this problem? And to do that, we looked at kind of a, a database version of the maximum. So instead of we still pick uh, the uh, min in our, of our interpolator according to the uh, RKHS norm or the network norm. But then once we have that, we measure this max selection by choosing uh, the point that sort of produces the maximal change in the interpolated function as measured over the data set itself. So now we're just evaluating those functions on the data set rather than over the continuous domain associated with the, the neural network or the, the kernel method. So here's just a comparison in these two examples. Uh, and as it goes, you kind of get the idea. So the database one does a little bit more exploration. Uh, the uh, non-database one is really focusing on that boundary. But uh, the database one sort of is striking a balance between exploring and covering the data, but also uh, focusing uh, on this uh, boundary between the two decision sets. And this is how, you know, in, again, looking at test error versus number of examples. Now this orange one is the database version of this maximin. And you can see it's performing better than passive. It, you know, at some point, this maximin is really, really nailing this boundary. But, uh, and so it does a little better eventually. But still, we get quite a bit of a gain out of this database uh, criterion in uh, this kind of experiment. So here's one of the other interesting properties of the database uh, criterion is that it has this idea, going back to that, the, the paper that I mentioned of Sandro, is suggesting that, oh, well, if we could somehow find clusters, let's get a representative from each cluster. This maximin database criterion actually automatically does that. That's what this picture is trying to show. It's pretty uniformly selecting examples within the clusters. Here it's, again, finding some and really trying to nail down those boundaries. And there's a little theorem associated with this. If we use this database norm, uh, then if we have well-separated clusters, uh, 
the database maxing min uh, automatically selects one representative from each cluster. So that was a paper that Mina and I had at LR10 last week or the week before. And this is just kind of to, to wrap up with some experiments. This is some experiment on MNIST, uh, where again we're looking at the uh, maximin and this database maximin, training error and test error. And you basically see a similar sort of story again. Uh, and uh, here on this experiment, we get like a three to four X uh, improvement in performance using the active learning methods. So um, with that, I think I'll just wrap up and, and take questions. So um, theory and methods for active learning are pretty well developed kind of in the classical statistical learning framework. Uh, but that framework doesn't really help us understand how to use active learning in modern machine learning systems like neural networks and so forth. So we've kind of looked at this new active learning uh, maxi-min type of idea based on interpolation and so forth. And I kind of told you a little bit of what we understand. Um, that's about all we understand. There's a lot of open questions there. But I think there are some really interesting questions associated with just like how do you do this computationally efficiently? Um, and you know, how do you extend it to more deeper architectures and all sorts of things? So uh, plenty of chances for jumping into this field. So with that, I'll stop and I'll take any questions. Thanks. Um, is there any work, so presumably labeling examples close to the decision boundary is harder than points that are far away, certainly some applications, say clinical data or something? Like harder for a human to make the judgment? Yeah. yeah. So is there any work that uh, takes that into account? Uh, I would suppose yes. It's a good question. Like there's a, we maybe have some uh, link between the cost of time and effort. Uh, uh, versus, you know, information gain that we get from that example. But off the top of my head, I, I mean, I, I probably could dig it up, but I, off the top of my head, I don't know what the best place to point you to is, but I'm pretty sure people have looked at something like that. But it, again, it would, so how do you actually gauge that cost? Say, I, yeah. So your function is smooth, right? When you're yeah. close to the decision boundary, then your noise is close to one half anyway. Right? So you might not really care, yeah. 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 Other questions? Yeah. Um, people try to look at the instance of the conversions of algorithms. Like, is it here that the minimaxes uh, Yeah, so the question is uh, kind of minimax versus instant based kind of. So, in, in Things like you know, multi-arm bandits and so forth, there's a lot of instance-based kinds of bounds. And there is some work uh, because one branch of the bandit literature is so-called combinatorial bandits, which encompasses virtually everything, although it's usually in a discrete setting. But there they have uh, you know, like instance uh, optimal kind of bounds for sample complexity that do tell you something about the difficulty of like a classification problem on an instance by instance basis. And Kevin Jamison, one of the guys who's worked with me a bit on this, has done some recent work that gets at that. Yeah. So it, it might be possible, but largely, especially in these more continuous domain settings, people haven't looked at it that way. And I, I don't know how easy it is, but, but the combinatorial bandit approach is one way to start tackling that. I have a quick question. Yeah. I missed something maybe before then, but um, to go in from the parameterized case where mm -hmm. you knew that the optimal classifier was in the class, if your uh, optimal classifier is not in the class and you follow this uh, falsification rule, it can lead you to wrong answers. So then you uh, post something in between that and the parameterizing. And I'm not really, I didn't catch the main idea of what is it that you do to prevent this problem from happening? Yeah, so I, I maybe one, so the question is like, how do we actually prevent this problem that I was saying you might converge to a suboptimal model? So I think the perspective that, that I'm taking here is one where we're assuming that all the labels, so we have a, a, a pool of data, examples, and we'll get a label, and those labels will be uh, uh, 
uncontroversial. Like we both would agree, this is a red, that's a blue. So the goal is really to label the entire data set. There's not going to be any errors in the labeling. It's perfect, let's just say that. So interpolation does make sense in that setting. And ultimately, we want to have a predictor that perfectly agrees with the label of every example. And we want to have something that, in principle, could achieve any possible labeling of the data. Certainly, I could keep marching along here. And, and whatever the labels come out to, if you give me a, a big enough norm, uh, I can interpolate all those data. Uh, but we're sort of buying or, biasing ourselves towards hoping there's a small norm solution to the labeling problem. But we're, with that in mind, we're going to say, well, what's going to be the most difficult example to label next, if that sort of makes sense. So that's where the heuristic is coming from. And it does seem to have good properties uh, that, uh, again, you'll never know. That's one of the problems here. I don't know exactly how to have a stopping criterion. You'd love to say, oh, you've labeled enough of the data set. You can stop now. Uh, yeah, it's hard to do that without having some underlying assumptions, right? Um, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, yes. So yeah. as you as you uh, reduce the dependency of uh, more labeling, so if you end up with a smaller level set, let's say in the ideal case, uh, do the, the uh, do those levels have to be better in terms of because levels themselves have error as well, right? So when doctors are yeah, so uh, you're asking about if the labels themselves maybe are inconsistent with the best possible classifier, so. Yeah, so um, most the, the latter part of this talk, where I was talking about the interpolation and so forth, the results I was giving were in situations where there is no label noise. If there is label noise, uh, for example, in that graph-based active learning procedure, there are ways to sort of robustify some of that process to uh, compensating for errors in labels. Um, here, Again, in this interpolation regime, for now, we're, we're really uh, only thinking about the case where the labels are perfectly consistent uh, and there's no noise in them. So we really do want to have a, a predictor that matches them, at least up to the sign. Um, but uh, that would be another important thing to think about. Like, wh what, what should we do if there's label noise on top of this? Maybe then, certainly, interpolation might not always be the right thing to do. And, and there's some understanding of that trade-off, too, as a function of like the signal-to-noise ratio or whatever. But how to bring this into this framework, that's a pretty open problem, because even those results are only starting to come out now. But I know that many of you are shy, so <laughs> we can have uh, direct questions uh, with Rob at the reception over there. So just turn left and have a reception. Thank you again. Great. Thank you.